You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine broadcast via New Channel TV in English and Persian. Hello everyone, I'm Maryam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing anti-Semitism with author and activist Muriel Seltman. In shocking news of the week, we're going to be discussing the arrests of labor activists in Iran prior to and during the 1st of May. The insane fatwa of the week is also from Iran and Khamenei, and it's about women waxing their pubic hairs. And the uh, good news of the week is growth and development of the movement for animal rights in Iran. Stay with us. Anti-Semitism flourishes in many places across the world and is often conflated with criticism of Israeli state occupation of Palestine. It's one of the pillars of the Islamist movement and deemed acceptable by many. Anti-Semitism, however, is a form of bigotry against people that must be unequivocally condemned. When you look at the issue of anti-Semitism, you do see that there is often this conflation with Israel government policies. So if you criticize the Israeli state, you're immediately accused of anti-Semitism. And you see this with the Islamists too. But this can't hide the fact that anti-Semitism is very real, it's very deep-rooted, and it is bigotry against people in the same way that, uh, you know, there's bigotry against Muslims, even if a criticism of Islamists isn't bigotry. Do you know what I mean? No, I, I agree. I abs abs absolutely agree. I mean, there's one issue about sort of Israeli state, and we can sort of discuss that um, slightly uh, differently. And then this issue of anti-Semitism, which is, has a, a longer history, um, and in actually... Um, it's in the beginning of end of the 20th century and beginning of the well, actually 20th century and beginning of the 21st century, it, it has been spreading with the growth of the Islamist movement. I think that, that's the uh, uh, that's one of the features of anti-Semitism and just blind hatred of people, irrespective, you know. And that sort of you could see that in many countries in Europe, which has a tradition of that, and we've seen that in the 20th century and. 21st century in Middle East, which has been growing. I think that, that, that hatred of people, it's, um, it's really uh, despicable and it needs to become the kind yeah. of... I mean, there is a, a longer history to it other than the Islamist movement too. It's historically, from thousands of years ago, this accusation that um, uh, Jewish people uh, drink uh, the blood of um, um, uh, Jesus, ge the yeah. Gentiles and yes, yeah, yes. It, it comes from, from there. And obviously, it, it, to some extent, um, after the um, you know um, end of Nazism in yes. Germany, there was a sort of dealing with anti-Semitism, pushing it back. Again, though, it is on the rise, and I think it it does have to do uh, quite a lot as well with the rise of the Islamist movement and just religious movements in general. No, I, I know, I agree, and I think um, Israeli government, not Israel, not Israel people who live in Israel not Jewish people who live in Israel or anywhere else, but Israeli government as a, a racist government doesn't help here, uh, the situation because there any criticism of the uh, um, politics of this uh, Israeli state, like any other state, is automatically deemed as um, anti-Semitic. And that, that's wrong. Uh, people should be able to and have the right to criticize um, Israeli state. But that anti-Semitism uh, that has been growing in the second part of the 20th century and particularly first part of the 21st century, the growth of the Middle East is very closely linked with the states and the Islamic states. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think any time uh, there's collective blame against people, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And I think it's common sense to see that, uh, you know, to place collective blame on all Jewish people. Uh, and not see the, the protests, the social and political movements, the fact that there are many uh, Jewish people within Israel and outside who are pro-Palestinian, who are pro the peace process, and who are anti uh, the Israeli state government's policies towards the Palestinian uh, people. And so I think it is important to see people and to defend their rights and to condemn any sort of collective blame and bigotry. Saltman, thank you so much for um, agreeing to do an interview with us. I wanted to ask you first off about the roots of anti-Semitism. 
right, the roots of anti-Semitism. Well, anti-Semitism goes back 2,000 years. It really starts with the accusation that the Jews killed Christ. And so it starts with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it continues from there with persecution going on. And in the, mid, in the Middle Ages, it got worse, much worse, because there were all sorts of additional accusations, like Jews poisoning wells if any uh, epidemic broke out. And there was a terrible, terrible accusation that Jews would murder a Christian child before Easter every year so that they could take his blood and use it in unleavened bread for the Passover, which was a monstrous slander. And that went on until modern times, of course. Now, uh, that's the roots of present-day European anti-Semitism. It was different for the Muslim world, actually, because um, Christians and Jews were treated as, as the people of the book, and they had what I believe was called dimmy status. And, uh, but that meant that in order to have protection, they had to undertake all sorts of provisions and do all sorts of things, like not building churches or synagogues in a uh, prominent place. There were all sorts of provisions, like having to walk to the left of Muslims and so on. Uh, and uh, those were embodied in something called the Pact of Umar in the 7th until the 9th centuries. But modern, modern uh, attitudes by the Muslim world uh, really got started properly in the Second World War and resulted from the Mufti of Jerusalem, who had been appointed by the British. Uh, and he left uh, uh, what was then called Palestine, and he uh, broadcast throughout the war from Berlin and broadcast uh, anti-Semitic Hitlerian propaganda to what was then what was called the Middle East. That's the roots of anti-Semitism. What are, I mean, obviously it has terrible effects on people, uh, you know, some of the things you've been saying. What what are the effects? The effects, uh, you mean today? Yeah. Well, today what is happening is an enormous uh, increase in anti-Semitism. And uh, this is masterminded actually by the political Islamists and centers around the issue of the existence of the State of Israel. The trouble is that the people who are behind this, the Islamists, they don't attack the Israeli government. They talk about Jews in general, which is a terrible thing because it implies that every Jew in the world, even though you have no connection whatsoever with the State of Israel, is responsible for anything that any government does uh, in Israel. Uh, and what has happened has been the merging of uh, the Islamist uh, attack in those terms with traditional anti-Semitism in Europe, which makes Jews feel very, very afraid. Uh, it's, the, it comes at you in a traditional form. You never know when somebody is unwittingly going to make an anti-Semitic remark. And it's a terrible thing when that happens, particularly from people who don't realize anti-Semitism, because in Europe, anti-Semitism has been part of religious education for 2,000 years. And people have absorbed anti-Semitic attitudes uh, for all that time. Jews are the other, the demon of the Western European world, the, the group that is different, and, and it has made Jews feel very, very helpless for all that time. And uh, it's only since the establishment of the State of Israel, of course, uh, and although I don't want to talk about the politics of that, it's only since then that Jews, like the French Jews, have felt there was somewhere for them to go. And if, if they're afraid, or terrorized, or when there are killings like the supermarket in Paris some weeks ago, they feel they have somewhere to go. 
It's not as bad in the UK, although it is now much worse than it ever was. There is uh, sometimes this conflation between anti-Semitism and a criticism of the state of Israel's policies, for example. What's your position on that? Well, before there was a globalization, there was national anti-Semitism, and the, the ruling establishment in any country would point to the Jews who were in the ruling establishment and say, those, are the, those people are causing all your problems, so that they would divert, divert attention from the, themselves to the small number of Jews in the ruling establishment, but all the mass of ordinary Jew middle class and poor ones would suffer. Today there's globalization, and that means that it's the state of Israel which is being pointed to as uh, the origin of, of problems by the political Islamists. And they talk, as I said before, they talk about Jews instead of government of Israel and so forth. Now, there is no reason why anybody should not criticize any government whatsoever, and that includes Israel. But every anti-Semite in Europe has jumped on the bandwagon of this and under the guise of being anti-Israel and having some moral purity, they are actually being anti-Semitic. And, and, this, this and where the anti-Semitism comes in as well is not only calling, uh, speaking of Jews in, in general instead of the government of Israel, but also in implying the unique, uh, the unique evil of the state of Israel, irrespective of what other countries are doing anywhere else. And, and so the conflation has terrible consequences. As a final question, since our time is running out, I'd like to ask, uh, you know, the importance of combating anti-Semitism, uh, as, as, as is, is important to combat all forms of bigotry and prejudice. Absolutely, absolutely. All forms of bigotry and prejudice. And anti-Semitism, uh, certainly, because it does three things. Well, there are three things I'd like to mention in that connection. One is the political reason why it should be combated. And that is because it diverts attention from what is really happening and focuses people on a false enemy. And they don't look at what is really causing all their problems, the economic problems they suffer. Secondly, there's a personal aspect. It is anti-human to have any bigotry whatsoever, whether it's, it's uh, Islamophobia or whether it's anti-Semitism, or it's seeing women as inferior, or black people, or homosexuals, it doesn't matter what, it has to be combated. And I'd like to, if we have to end now, I'd like to end on a cheerful note, which is not quite on the main point, the main issue, but it's something that needs mentioning. As we speak, in Palestine as a whole, including Israel, the peace activists in Israel are working together with Palestinian peace activists and they have joint actions together. They have meetings and demonstrations and they demonstrate peace processes together. And that is one of the most heartwarming things that's happening in the world today. But our ruling class dominated media do not report this. Let me ask one final, final question, and that is, who benefits and who loses from anti-Semitism? Well, this is an interesting question. The Islamists benefit because they can pick, portray themselves as the standard bearers against the great evil, the great demon, and they are wanting to set up an Islamic dictatorship, so it will help them in doing that. Secondly, it helps the establishments in the Arab and Muslim world because it, it diverts the attention of the ordinary people from them and what they are doing and uh, how they are oppressing the people. And it diverts it to the question of Israel. It also amazingly benefits the US imperialists and others because 
It means that the US government and other governments, like the UK government, have the, an excuse to institute all sorts of laws and, and with the excuse of the war against, against terror. So even, even they are benefiting. And finally benefiting is the present government, fascist government uh, of Israel, because they, faced with the continual threat of the elimination of the state of Israel, they can do, get away with things that they'd never get away with with the normal Israeli population. Who loses in all this? Obviously, the mass, the vast mass of ordinary people all over the world, because they, they lose everything by this. And it's tragic, heartbreaking. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Muriel Seltman. Muriel Seltman is a veteran and long-term activist, left activist, peace activist, um, an activist um, for women's rights, for secularism, uh, against cultural relativism. She's really a treasure, um, an, a global treasure, and we were really happy to have her on our program. And I think she raises a really many important points. One of them is, you know, this whole thing about the Jews are responsible for this and they're responsible for that. Who are these the Jews? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, um, and Muriel is great to hear um, on, on this issue because of the experience that she has uh, um, in this area. But I think the point um, that I really want to make is in defense of people of Israel. And I think many people um, uh, sort of do not recognize this. The fact that people of Israel has a right to live in the state, I think that's apart from that, a majority of a lot of people in Israel are progressive, left-wing, secularist, humanist, and they are fighting in that region for a better world for everybody. And I think they, they, they got a special, they, they need, you know, they should have a special recognition that in that area where there is huge anti-Semitism, where there is huge Islamist movement, where there is a sort of uh, um, reactionary uh, religious uh, government of Israel, they are actually fighting. It's quite a difficult uh, um, sort yeah, of fight, and I think, the and they need, and need a special recognition yeah, to make it, down this program. And it's also important not to conflate the state with Absolutely. people in the same way that we don't say, you know, all Iranian people are fascist Islamists because it's, there's an Islamic regime there. Why is that assumption made with the people in Israel? And it's because of politics and because of this conflation that takes place, and it shouldn't. And, and also we've seen that sort of progressive movement in Israel has come out on many occasions where, for example, there was these video clips, thousands of video clips came out of um, Israel for people who actually, they send greetings and uh, and peace and support to people of Iran during the uh, uh, the last of um, our peoples in Iran, and that's great to see. And I think there is a uh, then, then we need to sort of uh, strengthen that uh, relationship between secularists, between human rights activists, and people ev everywhere. And I think uh, and I really want to reiterate this in this program. We like sort of to thank to you, make that point yeah. of uh, defending <laughs> people of Israel. Okay, think, thank yeah. you. I mean, one of the things that Muriel does say is that very often these sort of divisions are in the interest of the ruling elite, it's the states that perpetrate these, and it's in our interest to go beyond these divisions um, of Jewish and Muslim and to see each other and uh, as human and as citizens. And I think that is a very strong message and one that is desperately needed in our times. In shocking news of the week, we are looking at the arrests of large numbers of labor activists in Iran prior to the 1st of May, International Workers' Day, and during the 1st of May, in order to stop and suppress the protests. Now, what's interesting, the Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif recently went on a program in the US, Charlie Rose's program, yes. and said that they don't arrest anyone for their political opinion, and he said, it's if people commit crimes, if they violate their laws and they hide behind being journalists or political activists, then they've 
not follow the laws and they need to be arrested. And I think, I think, I think, I think <laughs> he, he has a point, you know. Every, the majority of population in Iran, 99% of Iran, are outside of the Islamic regime laws. Labour activists, if they want to organise the trade unions, it's against the law. For these, if you're a woman, it's against the law. If you're a absolutely, and he, he, he you thinker. know, what, what he doesn't say that he represents a vile, despotic uh, uh, Islamic regime that actually uh, doesn't recognize any rights for anybody and I think particularly when it comes to um, uh, labor rights and trade union rights from day one when Khomeini uh, that uh, godforsaken man who came to power he said uh, the first thing he said was well there's no such thing as uh, uh, workers everybody is a worker God is a worker to just deny the rights of the uh, working class and recently just before and this has been going on every year and this year three or four weeks before, um, 1st of May, uh, they must started rounding up all the trade unions. We have had uh, the leaders of the Tehran uh, and uh, suburbs uh, boss oh. trade unions, yeah. Ibrahim and Ma uh, Madadi and Davud al-Razavi, been mm -hmm. arrested and taken into Evan prison. Mm -hmm. uh, Mahmoud al-Salehi from Saqiz, uh, he was who was the coordinating committee for the trade unions organization in Iran. He's been arrested. He's actually been taken uh, to uh, Ministry of Intelligence officers, interrogated for five hours and coerced to, to force him to actually announce the cancellation of the first May, as if you know that is possible, and, and many other. I mean, I can see about there, 30, there's, 40. There's lots of names, and we're actually going to show a clip after this section to make sure that we mention the names and the unions that they all belong to. One thing that it does show, aside from the repression of the regime, is the fact that. The regime is so concerned about labor activism and the work of um, um, labor activists and uh, leaders that it uh, tries to arrest them even before May 1st and constantly harasses, imprisons and detains them. But that does not stop the organizing. It's something the regime is afraid of. It's important resistance. The working class leaders in Iran are the conscience of the society. It's important that we demand immediately all of their freedoms. They haven't done anything wrong, Mr. Zarif. You and your government arrest people every day for not having done anything wrong. If anyone's done anything wrong, it's you and your regime. This week's insane fatwa is from the insane of the insane, which is Ayatollah Khamenei from Iran. And he and some of his buddies have issued a fatwa that says that women shouldn't wax, those who are waxing women's pubic hair, they shouldn't look at the area involved. And a woman can wax another woman's underarm. She can look at that, but don't look anywhere else. Uh, this is the great this is leader. Of, this is the great. This is the great He's very lead, busy. Great leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So busy. This busy, is the, busy, the busy, essence busy. of the Islamist movement is coming out. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. You might be his preference. He might. He, he might like a lot of hairy people. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to know about his, his preferences. Okay. No, but interesting is that you know this is this is the Islamist. This is the Islamist. Uh, actually been going around in many cities and they wanted actually ban banning any any hair we want mm. sort of uh, no matter even privately but if you've got to do it don't look just you know, go, you know just make just sure you don't look cause and, and also, um, they've, they've, they've been sort of saying that uh, um, hair removal will increase spread AIDS <laughs> ignorance AIDS and hep hepatitis oh B gosh. and C and whatever uh, AIDS, this, this, is, this is crazy this is, is the supreme spiritual leader of an entire country. Yes. Scary, scary stuff. Good news in this week is a protest in the city of Shiraz in Fars province uh, in Iran, where a group of people came out in support of uh, animal rights and against animal 
cruelty. Uh, there is, of course, there's a dark side to this, the fact that uh, that has been sort of um, killing of stray dogs in Iran. Yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's videos that have come yes. to light in which people said that they are being paid five dollars to kill slay, stray dogs, but with acid. And there's images of these dogs dying in the most excruciating yes. pain. And the good news is here, Mariam, that, yeah. they, that people have been protesting yeah. both on social media yeah. and in Shiraz for the first time. A group have come out and in defence of the uh, animal rights and that, that's such a good good thing and this is sort of coming from last year when the Islamists started saying that keeping animals and looking after animals in your home is against Islam you know, and the, you know the ban thing if they arrest people and charge people and file people on the streets if they, got, uh, if they have animals and on the back of that they started sort of killing animals and now the growth against that the, the movement is actually saying no, we, we don't rec we, we don't accept this, and I think it shows that protest, especially in Iran, where any protest is quite difficult to organise. It shows the depth of um, unhappiness about these things, and uh, how much people want to openly protest and defend the rights of animals. I mean, I think the thing is that, especially under uh, you know an Islamic state where dogs in particular are seen to be untouchable, you yes. know, they're dirty. Uh, if you if you actually if you pray. Um, you, and a dog touches you, your prayer becomes... Doesn't work, you've got to start it, again. It, it becomes invalid. Yes. And so in that sense, you've, you've always had the regime telling people they shouldn't have dogs, dogs are dirty, and this, yes. so on and so forth. But a lot of people do have animals, and they love animals. And I think this protest really goes to show that even, you know, no matter how much publicity there is against animals, that there are you know the humanity of people the and the human love of animals feelings come is out. Still absolutely there. so this yeah. is this is a great news i yeah. think um, in particular for iran and middle east and it's just taking the animal rights movement is actually taking shape and this is a beautiful thing to see yeah actually. definitely yes. yeah so we are reaching the end of our program we hope you enjoyed this week's program we want to remind you about our patreon a fundraising campaign and also remind you we forgot to remind you last time to write to us to send us your comments and your ideas for upcoming programs we love to hear from you and so we could we could say goodbye for yeah, this week definitely. and from me Faribos Puyo and Mariam and Namazi. Mariam Namazi. have a lovely week and we'll see you again next week at the same time bye Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.